uh, mail and LinkedIn and things of this kind. Um, okay. Um, so this this week's lecture is going to be, to some extent, uh, sort of open ended, um, and it's it's going to be open ended because I have a lot of examples to show you, and um, these examples I can just continue until the time runs out. Um, although I will probably stop at a certain stage to enable discussion. But because we're talking examples, I also encourage you to, uh, to ask questions during, to ask for clarifications maybe during the, uh, during the presentation. Um, that's because examples are useful to the extent that they get discussed and understood in, uh, in, in depth. Um, there will be some things which may appear, especially at the beginning, to be a little bit uh, esoteric, a little bit off track, and you will, you may ask yourselves, why is he telling me this? Uh, but if you bear with me, you'll see it all comes together at a certain stage. So let's start with the share then now. Um, here we are. The usual standard question, can you see my screen? Yes, it works okay. perfectly. Okay, that's great. Then here we go. Uh, of course, when I do this, I now lose sight of the chat and I lose sight of the uh, of the clock in, at the top right of my, my computer. When I lose sight of the chat, it means that if you send if you just write me a question, I don't see it. Uh, that's why I really encourage you to interrupt me. Uh, it's uh, it's 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 a dialogue now. Uh, please do interrupt me if there's anything you need clarification on. Don't just put a question in the in in the chat because I I don't see it. Uh, so I really do want you to interrupt me and ask me to go further into whatever it is that uh, that you want clarification about or to question or to discuss. So the the topic today is experiencing public spaces. So the first thing I'm going to do is question what is a public space uh, and usually we do this by looking at cities because they are the most familiar public spaces and people because we are the people who have to occupy those public spaces um, it may seem self-evident but believe me it's not i always start this uh, approach by questioning our concept of a city. Because, you know, in my experience has taught me over the years that we all have a subjective concept of a city. That subjective concept tends, because it's subjective, of course, it tends to be related to, well, our own experience of cities. And so it tends to be related to the cities either where we live or where we have lived or where we spend a lot of time. Um, or to an abstract idea of a, of, a, of a metropolis, maybe. Now, in this case, we have uh, the, the, the center of Berlin. Um, sometimes I ask people, you know, when I'm doing this in presence, I ask people, do you know which city this is? Uh, and intentionally, I have not put the, the name of the city on this slide. Uh, and it's because it can be quite misleading. A lot of people who don't know Berlin uh, find it... Uh, unusual to find such a stark modern architecture in the very, very center of the city. And of course, it's not one of those famous views like the Brandenburg Gate or the, the, the Reichstag building or anything of that kind. Uh, but this is a, a very important point for me uh, because this is the River Spree in the very center of Berlin. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have the uh, what used to be in West Berlin, and everything from the historic building in the center background on the right hand side uh, back to uh, everything on this side of the river in the middle ground, and everything on the left hand side. This was all East Berlin. So the the Berlin Wall used to meet the River Spree at this point, at the point where the, the pavement is lower down on the right hand side. You can see there's a little, maybe if you if you have good uh, vision on your computer screen, you can see there is a, a, a fence 
along the river uh, on the right hand side and there is a plaque by the river and that is the plaque that commemorates the people who who died trying to cross the the river spree during the time of the berlin wall uh, i was very much alive at that time and i i was often in berlin uh, during the time of the berlin wall uh, i went there the first time in 1973 and um, I went back repeatedly every year and I saw Berlin immediately after the wall came down or actually while the wall was still there but hadn't yet been completely demolished at the end of 1989 uh, and the beginning of 1990. The building that you see projected across with an architectural cut from the left to the right is uh, very symbolic. It's the Paul Luber House. It houses the offices of the members of the Bundestag and it's a symbolic combination is a symbolic unity across the river the architectural uh, line of the roof that you can see on the left and on the, and continued on the right at the very top right hand corner uh, is the architectural continuity between the what was east and what was west berlin the building the green building that you see in the in the middle ground is the uh, german federal parliament um, press center where we held the conference uh, Culture for All in 2005. So that is a common idea of a city, a large international metropolis. But we need to question that. And I'm going to have to click on this to get the next one. OK. Another capital city on the left, Prague, is very, very different. It's undoubtedly a city. And yet uh, it has clearly some very, very different challenges when it comes to dealing with public space. In this case, the public space is invaded by cars. Uh, this is a very common issue that we have in, uh, in our cities, not only in Europe. Uh, on the right, you see the pedestrian area in the center of Regensburg, which is also another important historical city in, the, in Bavaria, in the south of Germany. Um, so they are actually quite close together, only a couple of hundred kilometers from one to the other. Uh, the, the situation with cars uh, simply doesn't uh, appear in the center of Regensburg in the, in the case of the area that you can see on the right, because the, the streets are pedestrian streets. They are too narrow for cars to get in. But the center, the central area of Regensburg anyway, is practically entirely pedestrianized, as indeed the, center, the central area of Berlin uh, is is due to be almost entirely pedestrianized according to the latest decision made by the, the city government. So there are challenges arising all the time, as we can see from the different types of infrastructures that we have in our cities. Uh, and we can't, it's quite clear that one size doesn't fit all. Uh, one solution will obviously not be right for everybody. We can already see on the right in the case of Prague, that there is plenty of opportunity if we can get rid of the cars. Of course, that does raise the issue, how do people with uh, reduced mobility get around? And that is certainly an issue to be tackled, but actually it does make it an awful lot easier if you don't have so many private cars which are parked there by people who fundamentally don't have any mobility issues. Uh, the situation that we see in the, the narrow street of Regensburg does rather raise some questions about the placement of street furniture. Uh, we always have to remember that blind people use sticks and tend to find their way along the side of the buildings uh, in the absence of anything else. Uh, and in this case, they would run into the obstruction of that planter with a plant on the left-hand side and repeated little elements. So even though it seems to be relatively straightforward in that street in Regensburg, there is room for improvement. Uh, now, another couple of capital cities here, which will be familiar to you, of course, as well. There's Novi Sviat on the left in Warsaw, uh, a semi-pedestrianized street. We can see there is a, a, a taxi going along the road there. There is traffic in Novi Sviat, uh, but people are also walking on the street. It's a, a street where there is plenty of space for doing things. When you have space, you have an awful lot more freedom to uh, do rational space planning uh, and to make rational use of your street furniture. Uh, 
on the right, you know, I've used the symbol of the tower of the station in Helsinki as a, um, as, well, as an icon of a modern capital city. Helsinki will crop up again in another photograph. We also have another couple of uh, capital cities, again, in your consortium, uh, Tallinn and Riga, uh, both of them uh, very attractive city centres, which have a very marked tourism vocation. Uh, so there is a, a good deal of interest to maintain a high quality of the environment and a high quality of life. The, the reality of the situation of the historical center of Tallinn, despite it being so beautiful to look at and all the beautiful greenery, is that the local inhabitants of Tallinn uh, have been, uh, well, they've told us in, uh, in workshops that we've done in Tallinn, uh, that there is a sense of alienation because the, the, the center of the city has been overrun sometimes by the uh, alcohol tourists, whose behavior is not exactly shall we say, uh, the most uh, attractive. Uh, and so some local people living in Tallinn have actually told us uh, in the past, uh, in the series of workshops and the things that we have done there, that uh, they make a point of avoiding the city centre. So that is obviously a major challenge again, not just one of uh, street furniture, but obviously of how we can use the elements that we put into uh, our public spaces to encourage more social behavior and discourage anti-social behavior. Let's see if we can ever manage to do that. Um, on the bottom right, I've used the center of Riga. There is a lot of space available in this uh, beautiful park uh, near the Opera House and around the, the, the center of the old uh, city of Riga. Uh, again, focus on uh, cultural tourism, because this is a beautiful city and it is possible to attract uh, large numbers of people. As usual, there is the uh, challenge of making these large numbers uh, cohabit uh, in a positive way with, the, with, with the, the, the local residents, so that we don't end up with the phenomenon that is so celebrated from Barcelona of the uh, uh, antipathy of uh, the tourist rush. When a capital city or a city, these are two capitals again, of course, when a, when a city has plenty of space, as I said, it, it, it does make it so much easier for you to do things. I've chosen these two for obvious reasons. Uh, I've taken the, on the bottom right, the, uh, the Cathedral Square in Helsinki offers a, a very good example of the abundant space that was designed into Helsinki when it was created as the capital of the Grand Duchy of, uh, of Finland after the takeover by the Russian Tsar in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, replacing the, the previous capital, which had been more over towards the Western side uh, in reference, of course, to its vicinity to, to the previous Swedish overlords. Um, Finland has benefited from this in the long run and by having a capital city that was built rationally and with uh, on, a, on a very attractive plan in the in the center of the city, uh, starting already by making abundant space available. When you have all that space, just look how easy it is to take into consideration the needs, the different needs of different users with these wonderful wide streets where you can put down the pedestrian crossings uh, and you don't have to cram them in between all sorts of other features. Uh, looking up on the right-hand side, we have the, a typical crossroads in the center, not quite the center, uh, in the early, well, the late 19th century and early 20th century developments uh, around the old uh, original barrio of Madrid. And here you see um, that the city was developed with space in mind. The original barrio, of course, is an exception to this rule. Uh, it has uh, a more late medieval approach with narrow streets. Um, but as soon as the city broke out of those confines, it was developed very much on the same uh, line of thinking as the Ensanche area in Barcelona. So you have these square city blocks and uh, with wide pavements, plenty of trees, 
lining the, the, the pavements, which do give an impression of quality of environment straight away. And crucially for us, uh, plenty of space for the interactions between vehicles and pedestrians. Now, I don't know how well you can see the photograph. Again, it depends on the degree of resolution in your computer screens, but <clears throat> the crosswalks, the pedestrian crossings, uh, are very carefully approached from the uh, from, from the from the pavement. Uh, there is a curb cut which goes down, which brings the level of the pedestrian down to the to the level of the street. The area of interaction between the pavement and the street level is marked with a tactile surface, which is also pink in color. Uh, so on both of those uh, areas, there is pink tiling, which is tactile, so that a, a person using a, a white stick to find their way around can reach the edge of the pavement from the line of the building where you see the red door in the background and can then find where is the edge which means the end of my area of safety and the beginning of the area where there is a potential danger. Now of course most people would imagine that a blind person needs to have a curb to find that interface between safety and danger. But of course, if we leave the curb there, we create a challenge for people who use wheels for mobility. So we need to come to a compromise. And this is the result of the compromise that yes, we lower the pavement. And that means that there is no curb anymore. But if there's no curb, we need something else. And what we have there then is a tactile surface, which tells you that this is the end of the safe area. But because we're in the southern part of Europe, <clears throat> we know that something of that kind could also very easily be used by an undisciplined car driver as an invitation to drive a car up and park it on the pavement. And of course, this used to be the case in Madrid, as in many other cities in the, in the, in the south of Europe. And in Italy, it still is, unfortunately. Uh, so there was uh, a, 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 there is a policy to install uh, blockages, these green posts that you can see at regular intervals, which are quite wide enough to ensure that any wheelchair or baby buggy or a reasonably sized um, system for moving around independently can get through without any difficulty, but at the same time, they are close enough together to ensure that no car can get up onto the pavement. They, they act as a block. What we cannot see very clearly in this photograph because of the uh, resolution of the photograph is the extent to which those may be hazardous for people who can't see very well. Uh, I believe that the red tactile surfaces clarify the fact that there is a barrier around. In fact, on the left, I can see white air or gray areas around the base of the green posts, whereas the, the pink areas are telling me that I can go safely towards the, the road. So I think there is a tactile difference, which means that uh, you avoid the danger of running into these things if you can't see. Uh, of course, we can then also have uh, remotely controlled uh, traffic lights. Um, so this, this, though, does mean that everybody who has the need for the remote control of the traffic lights would need to have a remote control uh, command unit in his or her pocket, or that could be with a, an app on a smartphone. Uh, since that is uh, a demanding issue, it costs money to install the technology and to ensure that everybody has it, because if, if it's got to be used, then everybody has to have it. Um, I'm uncertain about whether that's a good solution. On the other hand, you can also, uh, sorry, some, but somebody has their, their microphone turned on. Would you please switch it off? Uh, 
I can I can hear that there is a, a microphone switched on. Uh, the the oh, name the, the name is Tauno. Uh, the microphone is on. Can you switch it off. Okay, I'll continue then now. Um, the um, sorry, this does make me lose my train of thought uh, when when there's a when there's a, a background interruption. Um, the only other way to overcome this is to have uh, a sound on the on on the traffic lights to alert to when. Uh, it's safe to cross the road. Now, again, this is a good solution, except, of course, for the people who live there, uh, because to have this sound during the day is probably not disturbing. But if it continues during the night as well, it can be irritating uh, because in the when 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 there is less traffic noise, the uh, that kind of sound becomes amplified so this always requires in every single case dialogue dialogue not only between the people who want to cross the road but also uh, with the local residents to find which is the best solution for all of this now there is another way to cross the road as well rather than bringing the uh, the pavement level down and that is to raise the level of the uh, uh, the pedestrian crossing. This has been done in many places as well, because if you raise the level of pedestrian crossing, you automatically create uh, a speed bump, which inhibits the speed of vehicles. When the streets are straight and wide, uh, like the one that you can see in Madrid, uh, it does act as a, a psychological encouragement to amplify your speed to exp to 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 increase your speed as you drive and without necessarily even noticing it so i'm not saying that this is something that people do on purpose but the perception of our speed when we are car drivers is different when we are driving on a narrow and confined street or when we are driving on a wide open flat street so it may be useful sometimes rather than putting the level down it may be useful to raise the level of the uh, of of the of the, the the road up so that the cars are forced to go more slowly this is the reality that we have in many many cities uh, i took this series of photographs at a crossroads in the center of milan in corso monforte a few years ago um, nothing much has changed in Corso Monforte in the meantime. This is the way the centres of our cities are. Um, it's um, the, the classical situation that we see here is that that we uh, that is the uh, the delivery vans in the top two photographs. You are seeing on the left and on the right the same view from the front and from the back. Uh, delivery vans are parked half up and half, half down on the pavement just for five minutes. Each one of them always has the excuse ready just for five minutes. The problem is that, uh, of course, those five minutes, you add them together and the entire pavement is full of parked cars just for five minutes all day. Uh, it's quite clear that this really inhibits the ability to walk easily or to move easily along the pavement. It's very narrow, as you can see in both of these photographs. Uh, it really is a challenge to get through with a baby buggy or with a wheelchair. With a power wheelchair, practically, you can forget it. There just simply is not the space to get through. Uh, it doesn't help, then, if we see on the top left that we have bicycles uh, tied up to the lamppost. Now, of course, we want people to use bicycles in the city centres, so we need to have somewhere to put the bicycle. It's logical, but if there's nowhere to put the bicycle, people will, of course, tie them up wherever they can, and this adds to the obstructions. Uh, I don't think I need to tell any of you that the situation has become much, much worse because of the electric scooters, which are now abandoned literally everywhere. 
across the streets, across the pavements, just left abandoned with no thought for uh, whoever is going to come along afterwards, uh, making a real obstacle course out of every single pavement in city centres. Now, if we go down to the the bottom right photo, we see the same one as the, the same street as in the top right photo above, but the other the other side of the road. Uh, there are several things to say here, good things and bad things. Well, let's start with the, the good ones. We have an attempt to use street furniture. Um, we have an attempt to put in greenery. Uh, the greenery that lines the building on the left hand side is in the best in with the best intentions but it fails it fails because a blind person would not be able to move along there in safety because you simply cannot find the bottom of the building you can't find the bottom of the building because the plant is in the way but we do want to have vegetation in the street so let's try to uh, take our inspiration from the location of the waste paper basket and the no parking sign along this side of the curb, not the temporary one, the, the one that's higher up that says from zero to 24 and is then completely ignored, as you can see, um, because of the cars and the, the trucks parked all the way along the street. Um, that is the correct position to put the street furniture. The pavement on the left hand side of the street is actually quite wide. So it does leave us space to be able to work with it and place street furniture along the outer side of the pavement, which has uh, the advantage, has two advantages. One of them is that it creates a safe barrier between the motorized area in the street and the pedestrian area on the left. So there is a, 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 a perceptual and a, and a physical barrier, which is a good thing to have in this case. Uh, and the second is that it removes the features from the side of the building and would put them along the side of the pavement so it would be easier for a blind person to move along that street without obstructions now of course the negatives first of all of course yes the cars parked where they shouldn't be uh, you can see the little smart on the right hand side is parked in an area that is quite clearly marked for no parking uh, there is actually a, a temporary tow sign just beyond it and that doesn't seem to make the blindest bit of difference to people that are parking uh, it's the same street by the way that you can see in the top left hand photograph uh, the very beginning it's the same the same position the photograph uh, the bottom right was taken from underneath the green sign at the very back of the photograph in the top left so you can see the cars are parked there uh, they should not be because they're supposed to be removed it, it, it says there is a, a haulage uh, for cars that are parked there uh, and only residents are permitted to park in the second part of it but they're parked all the way along and then there's the bicycle yes again same situation as the other one you know you, if we want people to use bicycles we have to give them somewhere to put them that one he's trying to keep it he she is trying to keep it out of the way uh, doing their best but um, it still is an obstruction for anyone who's trying to find the corner of the building in order to find their way further along. Then, of course, the curb cut is simply insufficient. It's um, the curb goes down, but it doesn't reach down smoothly to the to, to the to the road surface, which means that it's worse than useless. Now we come to the pièce de la résistance, the, the, the worst piece of all on the bottom left. Uh, there you see my dear old friend Luigi Bandini Butti, who passed away a few years ago, two years ago. Uh, Luigi was the father of ergonomics in Italy. Uh, at that time, when you could see the photograph, he was the president of Design for All Italia. Uh, a wonderful man, great designer, uh, a great theorist, a great practitioner, and he had a wooden leg. He had difficulty getting around. Now, uh, this is the same street again. It's the continuation behind the black van at the crossroads. This is a typical situation that we find again and again and again in our cities. We find that the street is opened up for roadworks and then abandoned. We don't know when the work will be finished. And in the meantime, you have to adapt. Remember what I said last week about being forced to adapt, we force ourselves to adapt to a hostile environment. 
Well, here we are forcing ourselves to adapt to the hostile environment again by obliging people to get down off the pavement and walk along the street, expose themselves to the oncoming traffic in danger. And this is a major street in the, in the center of Milan. It's not a minor one. Uh, I'm seeing on the chat, uh, Astrid Org says there is no sound. Is it only my problem? So uh, I don't know if anybody else has that issue. Maybe uh, we can deal with it. Um, it's um, okay. I think it's only one person's problem. Uh, the situation here is a classic of cities. Uh, we often actually find a sign written in Italian that says stiamo lavorando per voi, which means we're working for you. And that just adds insult to injury because it's clear that nobody's working. There's nobody there. Now, um, the, the, the message here, of course, in itself has nothing to do with street furniture, but it has everything to do with how we think about public spaces. If you're going to work in public spaces, plan the work, start it, do it, finish it, remove the obstructions, because it should be temporary. Of course, humans have built some fantastic cities and some quite unique ones. And, you know, this means that we have, sorry, I'm, that was not supposed to happen. I was, I was closing the, uh, the, the chat thing. Um, because I do see the chat sometimes, I get an alert at the top of the screen. This, of course, is Venice. It's the Giudecca in Venice. It's not the center where most people go. It's not the part of the city that most of you would be familiar with. Uh, it's quite a way away from the city center. Uh, it just shows that we humans have not always built in the same way and in the same kinds of places. So the challenges that we face with everything that we do in our public spaces can be quite different, can be quite radical. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing chat all the time. Yes, okay, now it seems that it, it's working, right. Now, and we've also built some purpose-built settlements. This is the Margaritenhöhe in Essen. Uh, there was a period at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th when uh, large industrialists in many countries uh, built special towns, small towns or neighborhoods for the people working in their factories, their mines, their businesses. Uh, Margaritenhöhe was built for the, uh, the Krupp family in, the, in, in Essen, in the, in the area around Essen. Uh, the quality of the environment is quite high, it's self-contained, uh, and there are many examples of this kind. Here is another one, Nikishowicz uh, in Katowice in Poland, in the south of Poland. Uh, obviously very different to look at because the materials were different, uh, the materials that were available to be used were different. Uh, the red paint I've been Old was because this was a characteristic of the, the, the architecture in Silesia at the time, used throughout all the mining area. There are, are about 20 of these self-contained units uh, around the greater urban area of Upper Silesia. Uh, some of them are in better condition than others. Nikishovitz is in particularly good condition, uh, but it does present issues, of course, issues of access, uh, stairs everywhere. And the reason for the stairs is because uh, there are cellars which are semi-cellars. You can see the, the arches on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side at ground level. This would be where the, the, the coal would be unloaded into the basements of the building for use in winter heating. Uh, these these uh, places, in any case, uh, offer a lot of potential for redevelopment. And Nikishovitz is actually a very attractive uh, redevelopment now. <clears throat> We've built many horrors, sometimes with the best intentions. This is a square in the center of uh, the town of Bitom, also in the Upper Silesia. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I would have liked to be able to show you more of the ends of this ramp, but I was standing with my back against the building on the other side of the square. Now, the ramp in itself is very well designed and very well built. It has the correct slopes. 
It has the passing place, the, the resting places at the center and also at each extremity of the ramp. It has grab bars at different differentiated levels. It's wide enough. Uh, so what's wrong with it? Well, the thing that's wrong with it is that it occupies half the square. And it doesn't make sense to occupy half a square with a ramp like this in order to provide access to the municipal library at the top on the right hand side, as you can see, Mieszka Biblioteka. Uh, the, uh, the access to the library should be on the ground floor. It doesn't make sense to fill the square with this. The best intentions, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This is simply the wrong way to go about it. We also have some very fine spaces. Some of them are modern, and this one is in Gdynia. Gdynia, as you know, is the purpose-built city for Poland's harbor uh, between the wars when Poland had a very narrow access to the Baltic Sea. The, the, Gdynia was uh, purpose-built. There was practically nothing there before, only a very small village. And the city and its harbors were all purpose-built in the 1920s uh, and completed uh, in the 1930s. In, uh, rational architecture with plenty of open space. This is the esplanade in the very center of Gdynia. Again, you see, when you build with plenty of space like this, you do make it possible to intervene later on with new uh, features uh, to, make the, to, to make the city more inclusive. It's very easy to do it. If you have space, you can do things more easily. Uh, and we also have beautiful spaces which are classical, like this, uh, the gardens of the Palace of Queluz, uh, just outside Lisbon in Portugal. There is one issue, though, here, and that is that many of these places, and we can also look at the palaces in the, in the environs of uh, Warsaw or many other classical palaces, also around Tallinn, uh, around Riga, uh, around uh, Vilnius, uh, that I, re that I uh, remember, uh, the places also maybe in Mecklenburg in Germany. So I'm, I'm thinking uh, very quickly now of the, the palaces I've seen and visited around the Baltic Sea. <clears throat> it's very common to use this uh, gravel as the surface in the gardens and in the courtyards. There is only, of course, one issue about that. The gardeners love them because it's easy to rake them and to keep them clear of weeds and to keep them looking good. But if you're not very careful, you sink in. Uh, so if, uh, if someone is wearing a, a heel uh, that's slightly sharp, the heel will sink into the gravel. If you're using wheels, a wheelchair or a baby buggy of any kind, you will sink in and you cannot get traction. You just sink in. It's like having a car sinking into the mud on a wet uh, country road. So this is not, although it may look nice, we have to do something about it. And it is possible. This is a solution I saw just last year in spring, quite close to my home in the gardens of uh, Villa Carlotta in Tremezzo, uh, just on the other side of the lake from here. Um, there is a system for compacting the uh, gravel. And I found that it does seem to work rather well. The only thing I disagree with is the sign on the right hand side which says that the access is reserved for people with well with impaired mobility they call it yes uh, <clears throat> and i don't understand why it should be reserved i don't i don't like this idea of a separate entrance we should all be able to use the same entrance with the same dignity this sign gives the impression that if you can walk, you're not allowed to use that path. And that is frankly a load of rubbish. It doesn't make any sense at all. We should all be using the same paths. Of course, there are paths in those gardens which go snaking all the way up, climbing quite high above the lake, and they are not suitable for a wheelchair. But that doesn't mean to say that the paths that are suitable should be reserved only for people using a wheelchair. That is not right. Of course, many people live in small towns. Maybe not as small as this one, Goriano Sicoli, uh, in Abruzzo, in the Apennines, in the center of, uh, of Italy. Uh, it was seriously damaged during the earthquake in, uh, that, that, that destroyed L'Aquila a few years ago. <clears throat> this, uh, this village has a, an interesting story behind it. 
the uh, the artist Escher uh, drew this village. It's one of his famous drawings uh, is of this village of Goliamo Sicoli. And while he was drawing it, he was arrested uh, because Mussolini's police thought that he was a spy, whereas he was just uh, just an artist who was drawing uh, pictures of, uh, of mountain villages. Why a spy would want to have drawn Goriano Sicoli, I have no idea, because I can't imagine the strategic military advantage of having drawings of Goriano Sicoli, but Mussolini's police were very suspicious, apparently, and they arrested him and expelled him. <clears throat> Why did I choose Goriano? Because it's a classical case of the small places in the mountains, uh, which have physical challenges, because of the differences in level, you know, to get to the church at the top, you have to go up steep streets, sorry, steep streets, and in some cases, staircases. Uh, but there is also another physical challenge, which is that these small towns are quite difficult to reach in themselves. So they discourage people from staying there. Uh, and there is a tendency for these towns to be depopulated because of the difficulties that are encountered in living there. But we want to encourage people to stay in these places because we have infrastructure there. As I said last week, it doesn't make sense to keep on building new infrastructure in cities and leaving infrastructure to go to waste in the countryside. And that's the other thing, of course, some of us live in the country. And this, just to make you envious, is the view from my terrace. So uh, it, it doesn't look like that today because today it's raining and it's miserable and you can't see the lake at all. But uh, that's what it looks like on a good day. And it looked like that yesterday morning. Again, why? Because we live in the country. A lot of people live in the country still. And we want to maintain the liveliness of our country residences, of our, the, the villages and the people living outside in the country. So we need to think in holistic terms. It's not just a matter of street furniture in the cities, but how can we encourage people to stay where they are and even to relocate to the countryside? Uh, again, questions. Wherever you live, our concept of the city is changing. I showed you this one last week. This was 2000 years ago. This, I, sh I showed you this one as well last week. The same city, 1000 years later, maybe a little bit more. And this is also the same city in the early 20th century, the region to the southwest of the center of Rome, which was built for the Universal Exposition, which never took place in the 1940s. We're obsessed with technology. Uh, this is a screenshot from uh, Fritz Lang's film Metropolis. And when we look at it, we think, oh no, we don't want to live in a world like that, do we? That's horrible. Are we sure? You know, we actually do. In many cases, urbanization has come to mean this. And this is not an artist's impression. This is a photograph of a real city. Uh, and it's it came up on a search that I did for smart cities. If this is what we mean by smart cities, we're going the wrong way. Uh, smart cities should be places that put the people first, not cars. In fact, that was our slogan for our Cities for All conference in Helsinki in 2012. People come first. We've, we need to reprioritize so that it's the people that come first and not the cars, not everything else, but the people. Now, cities and towns and villages are populated by people who are all different. So we must learn to think of cultural diversity. For example, do you read left to right? Well, most people in this audience do but there are cultures that read from right to left. And there are cultures that read from top to bottom. Uh, what's the lesson in this? It's quite straightforward. If you are going to prioritize a list of things that people should be doing, never rely on sequences that go from left to right, because not everybody has that culture. Some people prioritize from right to left. And there have been in history also cultures that did the zigzag. One line would go from left to right and the next from right to left. So uh, what we do know is that prioritization always takes place from top to bottom. So if you have a list of instructions, especially anything to do with emergencies in public places, always prioritize top to bottom. 
maybe you have a weakness for italics. I see far too many communications in public spaces written in italics, which are difficult for people to read, especially when you reduce the size of the uh, font. So I, I, I found this only just a few days ago and put it in here <clears throat> because I find it I, I find it amusing as an example. The um, the magician has read he, he wants to summon a demon, but what he's actually read is how to summon a lemon. And so the result of his of his spell has been that he has summoned a lemon instead of a demon. Um, <clears throat> and that is just a, a, a rather silly way maybe of, uh, of exemplifying that we really should be careful about using cursive, about using italics. What about icons? We presume that they mean the same thing to everybody, but do they really? Now, simple question who should use this toilet well we all know that this is the icon for a women's toilet when i have an audience in presence i usually now ask okay how many women here are wearing a skirt and usually the answer is well below 50 percent so why do we use the skirt as the symbol of a woman's toilet especially considering that there are cultures where men use uh, clothing of that kind, the jalabia, and women wear trousers. So you see, it's a convention of the icon. We have a convention of the icon, which we have learned to accept and to interpret, but it doesn't necessarily reflect the reality of our world. Now, I could ask about these. Of course, those of you who are in Poland and Lithuania, you know what these means, but the rest, the rest of us, when we encounter these for the first time, we are absolutely stumped. We have no idea whatsoever which one of these is for men and which one is for women. It would be interesting to do a straw poll to understand how many of you know about these, but uh, time would run short, and so I'm not going to do that. Maybe we can discuss it later on. Are these icons really meaningful to everyone? The two at the top are the two classical icons that we use for telephones. But do they actually bear much relationship to the kind of telephones we use today? What about a child? Have you ever seen a child interacting with the traditional dial-up telephone with a handset on the top left-hand side, the icon? They don't know how to use it. They don't know they, 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 they don't know that they have to lift the handset. They look at the dial and they try to press the numbers. In the very amusing video that I saw a couple of years ago of uh, a child interacting with a telephone like this, the child said, where do I take photographs? They had no idea how to use this telephone. And yet this is our icon for a telephone. The one at the bottom, it's the icon for storage on a computer. Again, a small child, when confronted with a real uh, floppy disk, three and a half inch floppy disk of this kind, reacted by saying, oh, look, someone made a model of the storage icon because the child had no relationship with a floppy disk. And the child had simply adopted this uh, icon as uh, meaning, this is how you store. But it didn't mean anything. There was no logical nexus between the icon and its function. For us, there is of an older generation, but for children, it means nothing. So the, the lesson behind all these things is when you use icons, be aware that they may not mean what do you think they mean? Or they may be totally meaningless to people. So that's why it's vitally important to consult with people when you're going to start using icons. Now, in the urban environment, it's always a good idea if you achieve continuity. This is a potential, this is a risk for uh, 
a, a disaster waiting for happen, waiting to happen. It's not there anymore. It's a, it's an old photograph, but you can see what was happening there. One office in the city administration in Milan had made a rather good curb cut, I have to say, blocking the possibility to take a car up there to park uh, with a good level uh, flat area, not one of those dreadful hemicycle things, but actually a good flat slope going down to the road. The only problem is that perceptually the, the, the car driver coming from the direction that I am in where I'm taking the photograph is not ready to stop because the pedestrian crossing is set five meters further along the road. Uh, so the other office, the one responsible for putting down the pedestrian crossings, had not been uh, co collaborating with the one responsible for the curb cuts. This is simply not good. We need to use design to avoid this, this cold, uncommunicative uh, environment. This is actually the station in Kruzov in uh, Silesia. It doesn't tell me that it's a station. There's no uh, language, no design language telling me that it's a station on the outside, it looks more like a, like a fire station. I don't know, a garage, something. Uh, when you go inside, it is totally, totally alienating. It's cold, it's unpleasant. And of course it gets used as a public toilet because that's how it looks. And so it's very unpleasant. It discourages the use of public transport. I'm not even going to talk about the stairs everywhere. It's just not the right way to do it. It's important to train staff as well. This was the American Express office in the center of Rome in uh, Piazza di Spagna. <clears throat> a wonderful ramp made of uh, very fine wood paneling, a uh, very fine parquet. It's a pity, of course, that it was lethally dangerous because it was so slippery uh, to overcome those, uh, th those marble steps. Uh, then, um, so, you had to put this, uh, this, well, it was an ashtray actually at the top there. This was how it looked from the outside. There was not really much point in that ramp anyway, because you couldn't get in there because of the step. By the way, these days uh, they have overcome it. There's a luxury shop in there now. American Express is not there anymore. Uh, and the, the steps inside have been removed. This was after the uh, ban on smoking in Italy came into force. Uh, again, you see a little barrier at the top of the steps. This is in Kaunas. I'm contrasting two approaches by banks in the centre of the city. Who wants my custom? The one who has made the attempt to have a ramp that comes around from one side. It's not perfect, okay, but it does try to uh, reiterate the architectural style, uh, the architectural language of the original step to go into the building, or the one on the left where there is uh, an, an ATM, uh, an automatic telling machine, which has simply been put into uh, a prefabricated unit at the height of the center of what used to be a door above a step. Now that's negative for two reasons. One is that the unit is too high in any case, and it would be very easy to have brought it lower down simply uh, because if it's a prefabricated unit you could cut the hole in a different level of the door uh, and the second is that that step should have been removed because of course there is no access to it if you're sitting in a wheelchair you can't get close enough to be able to use the machinery so the bank on the left the bank is not they are not saying i don't want your custom they're simply saying i'm too stupid to have thought about it Whereas the one on the right is saying, please come in. So it's clear who, get, who gets the custom of people using a wheelchair. And mine as well, as a matter of fact, in sympathy, in solidarity. And the same thing, again, in the centre of Kaunas. Very simple. These street cafes are very common in the centre of Kaunas. And not only, of course, uh, with their little terraces on the outside. The one on the left is saying, come in because they have this rudimentary approach. It's, it's nothing special, but it is a slope that enables everyone to get up there. And the one on the right is simply saying, I can't be bothered. It doesn't matter to me. I don't, I don't want you to come here. And the lady on the right with her, with her push chair probably would not be able to go in there unless she maneuvers it with some difficulty to get up onto the, onto the terrace. 
if you're going to use a sign, it should be clear. This one is an absolute gem. It says, Sie finden uns gegenüber, you find us opposite. It was in the, the Dusseldorf airport. I imagine the Reiserbank had moved its ATM to somewhere else. Uh, it wasn't opposite, believe me. The arrow is totally misleading because it tends to give the impression that you have to go around the back of the sign and come back again to the front. But I can tell you, I looked all over. I was looking for an ATM and I couldn't find it. So this sign is useless. It is simply um, visual pollution because it is not doing its job. It is saying, hey, look at me, I'm not here. And that's no use, is it? What, it should, what we should have there is a map, better if it's a tactile map, placed at the right level, that says you are here, and we have now moved to this other position so that we can find it. Otherwise, what's the point? There's no point in a sign like this. And in another airport, Malpensa, this shows the need, the desperate need for soul and emotion. This was in, uh, this is a place where they would park people who are waiting to be taken onto flights, people using wheelchairs. The reception is on the outside. So that it, once you are parked in here, you can't reach them. They can't hear you because of the noise. There's no information, no, no information panel, nothing to tell you if your flight has been delayed or if it's left without you, nothing. This really makes for anxiety. People who are already dependent on others for traveling, they don't need the added anxiety. Oh, and it could also be done with a little bit more love. It is horrible to look at. It's certainly not a good design of, uh, it's certainly not friendly, and it's not a good design for the city that wants to be the capital of design, of furniture design in the world. This is something which you would not do. This used to be the way to buy a ticket for the metro, for the, for the trams in Upper Silesia. Uh, you had to know in advance how long your journey would take and how many different municipalities your journey would cross through. Now, of course, nobody from outside the area had the faintest idea. And then it was only in Polish anyway, so people didn't use the trams if you came from outside. The result was predictable, gridlock with the cars. Nowhere to park, traffic always stopped. Uh, I complained about this bitterly to the city authorities in, uh, in Katowice, in the uh, Chorzov, in Bitom, in Sestnerice, in, in many others. And in the end, they did change it to a system like an oyster system. If you're going to use tactile surfaces, remember that they can mean different things to different people. This is in the, the Lisbon Expo from 1998. A different tactile surface can be useful to help you, to help people guide their way to the pillar in the, in the background and then find their way through. This is good, but remember that people will make this use of it. So if you're going to put these things down, be coherent about it and make sure that you don't get a mess like this in, in, in Svetovice, in, uh, in, in Poland, in, uh, in southern Poland again. You have all sorts of different surfaces here and the, 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 the cobbled surface does seem to be helping people to find their way around. And then you have this uh, spherical sculpture right in the middle. And there is an illumination underneath. I asked the city architect, what is the illumination for? And he said, well, in the winter, we have a lot of fog here and uh, people out on a Friday night or a Saturday night, uh, they didn't see very well where they were going and they would fall over this and hurt themselves. So we put a light there. And I said, yes. Did you realize that blind people would be using this anyway? to find their way around. So with or without the light, this was not the right place to put your street sculpture. Ah, he said, we didn't think of that. And that's the point, isn't it? People don't think about it. And our job is to make them realize. I'm not criticizing them unless we tell them they can't know. But that's our job is to tell them and to help them to, to, to learn this. Some obstacles serve no purpose at all that this barrier is always open between the railway station 
and the airport in Dusseldorf. When a railway train arrives, everybody gets off and rushes to get to the terminal as fast as possible. And this barrier seems to be put there to hurt them because they all come through at the same time. That is just nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, this one, reserved parking for people with disabilities in front of the social services office in Krozov. Well, yes, it's good to reserve the parking. It's good to make sure that other people don't use it. But how do you get in there if you're on your own? I don't need to explain. If you have a sign, it should always lead to a recognizable and usable infrastructure. This used to be along the River Daugava in Riga. Again, I complained with the city architect and they removed it because it's frankly insulting to have something like this. Uh, and if you have a clearly visible infrastructure, it should lead to the intended destination. Uh, this is a very clearly visible infrastructure. It's saying, if you are disabled, you come here and you can get into the cathedral. It's unfortunate that when you get to the cathedral, the pavement has been raised so high that you now have a step down. It used to be a step up, now it's a step down. So this is how not to do it. This is how to do it. Provide alternatives, steps and a ramp. In the Riederholm in Stockholm, which is a pedestrian area, the car that's parked on the right is there with a permit. And Dinkelsbühl, the little town in the south of Germany on the left. It's not difficult. This is another one, the late boat ticket office in Village, or five kilometers from here. Very tastefully designed. There are steps in the center, ramps on the left and right, with a little garden in the middle. It doesn't have to look like something for people with disabilities, you know, and that is actually very popular with trolley bags because a lot of people, a lot of tourists arrive with trolley bags in Bellagio. And this is how not to do it. This ramp is too long. It's too long and it's dangerous. So, you know, it's, it's a very long way up and it's a very long way uh, along with no resting places. Good intentions, but it doesn't function perfectly. Again, remember this one? When I saw it, I was reminded of this, Lombard Street in San Francisco. Uh, they actually made a feature out of it. Overcoming a difference in level, we can make it into an architectural feature or a landscaping feature. I'm not saying it should always be a tourist attraction like Lombard Street, but uh, we can make these things attractive. And we can also do things like this, tactile alternatives. This one is in... Italian, English, and Braille, all in relief, with a little map as well. It's the, the route from the Trevi to the Pantheon in the center of Rome. Uh, not everybody can read Braille. Blind people can't always read Braille. And in any case, it's only in one language at a time. And that's why it's recommended also to provide alternative reading options. Uh, and of course, we also like to suggest using uh, tactile models with descriptions in relief. So uh, this one is the Stephansdom, the cathedral in, uh, in Vienna. And I put my colleague there. Some of you maybe from, uh, from Finland will recognize just about uh, uh, my, my colleague there on the right, uh, who comes from Finland. Uh, uh, I asked her to, to touch so you could see the, the scale of the model. But these bronze models are really quite expensive. Uh, remember this one that I showed you last week? Just when can a protective building be modified? Uh, well, you can and should use technology in historical venues. Uh, this is the Ludovisi cloister in the Baths of Diocletian in Rome. And then use a consultation in practice. And I'm going to come to an end after this one because I'm going a little bit over time. I wanted to show you an example of user consultation in Copenhagen. Uh, when the Copenhagen Metro was first designed, it's our design uh, which is the design consultancy, uh, made a mock-up on site in the main square of Copenhagen for public consultation under this geodesic dome. This is the mock-up and this is the final result uh, made and uh, produced by uh, the design, well designed for Ital Design, uh, produced by Ansaldo in Genova uh, for uh, Copenhagen. Uh, you will notice the use of yellow that's now ubiquitous in public transport because the public consultation uh, proved that yellow is the colour that is most easily found when uh, people need to grab something quickly. So not just for people who are partially sighted, uh, but also as an emergency response. 
large windows so people don't suffer claustrophobia. A clean sweep throughout uh, makes it much easier for cleaning. Uh, the, the, the seating does not rest on the ground, on the floor, it's suspended from the side. And that also makes more space for guide dogs and for, um, for um, uh, any material you take with you for luggage or whatever you have with you. Uh, plenty of light. You may notice that there's not so much space for advertising and that may not be so popular with all the uh, public transport operators in the world. Uh, the focus here is more on uh, uh, traveler comfort, user comfort, and not so much on advertising. Uh, that's why you have the bigger windows. Of course, the bigger windows make sense when a large part of the line runs above ground and not below ground. Below ground is a different matter. The same experience has now been used in Milan's new uh, number five metro line. You see again, uh, the seats are raised above, they don't have any points on the, touching the ground. You have the same yellow grab bars, you have the same uh, clean sweep right through. Public interior spaces, the new auto grill service area at Villoresi Est near Milan. It's completely different because it is designed, it, this has the design for all quality label, by the way. Everything in the public area shopping is uh, reachable from a wheelchair. Uh, the service has been completely redesigned as well, uh, so that when you uh, want to get something from the, from the self-service restaurant on the right-hand side, it's, you don't take the tray yourself but uh, the, the person you're dealing with takes the tray for you and will take it to your table if you need it. Uh, there is a reception area by the door. So if you need assistance, you can ask for the reception. Uh, there are differentiated toilets. So I'm afraid I don't have photographs of them. I have to go back there one day to get some, uh, to get some photographs of the toilets. Uh, they, they also have family toilets, different sizes. So all of these things uh, make it completely uh, a, a, a really good example of accessibility. And it's also, it's also a sustainable building. Uh, so that I think is as far as I want to go. I was going to show you these things as well, but we're going over time. And this one is anyway about uh, use of publics, the use of, um, uh, the use of apps. Well, this one is, no, I will go very quickly about this one. Concise information. This is it's in a museum, by the way, a museum, um, the um, the National Roman Museum in Palazzo Massimo in Rome, a uh, project I ran uh, this year in September with the International Ma Masters in Arts Management at the Istituto Europeo di Design. Uh, the students were concerned, for example, about the communications in museums. Uh, simplifying the language and simplifying the communication so that everybody can understand and not only those people who are uh, already experts in archaeology or art history. Uh, so uh, they, I asked them to take one version of the information the, the, what, as, as it is now on the left and to rewrite it as they propose. So using a slightly different font uh, using bold for their titles and also simplifying the language and communicating a narrative which makes it easier for, for non-specialist visitors to understand. Uh, and this other group uh, worked on communication with uh, signage and apps. They proposed signage telling people already in the metro station how to get to the museum uh, and they, they, they showed the condition of the pedestrian crossings just outside uh, and then they talked about audience development and, and the museum development and they developed an app with all sorts of different content where they identified uh, the possibility to create your own profile and then to have multi-channel solutions with uh, activities and events uh, and lectures and games uh, and all sorts of different things, talking about uh, uh, telling stories about the same place, the same pieces in, in different ways. So collecting together, for example, famous pieces and figures, famous works of, uh, of, of art, and telling their stories, uh, describing the Roman imperial dynasties in a way that everybody can understand, and not only the specialists, uh, then providing 
uh, information about iconography and philology, the different changing styles and fashions uh, with short stories, uh, talking about techniques and materials, so paintings and mosaics, uh, sculpture, and also where do these things come from so that visitors from different parts of the world may find actually one of these things came from the area where you now live, maybe in Libya or in Palestine or in Turkey or in Egypt. Again, fashions, hair, beards, luxury. And then um, this was just one example, starting from one bust with a portrait of, of Hadrian, giving the example of all the different, different stories, the different narratives this could be included in. So this is a, a very, very extensive project that also just gives us a, a very, very quick view of the sort of thing that we can do with information technology in public spaces. And with that, I'm coming to the end. I know I've gone over time and I've gone way off topic, but the intention is actually to, to help you to uh, think holistically again, as I was accenting last week. So I'm now I'm going to in interrupt the share and let's throw it open to questions, discussion, and we'll see what happens. Now I can see the chat without any difficulty. So if you're going to ask questions, you can put them up there as well. Uh, now let's see what happens. To, over to you.